Samantha. Uh, Samantha Lewis is a teacher, teacher trainer, and materials writer based in Spain. She's co-authored a number of course books, including Interactive, Own It, and its Spanish version Collaborate, and a more American version called Shape It, which are secondary courses which focus on learner autonomy. She has trained primary and secondary school teachers of English in Spain, and she also has an MA specializing in English language teaching in secondary schools. Most recently, she's been involved as secondary lead at the British Council in order to move all of their face-to-face -face young learner classes across Spain to online classes in a very short space of time. And her antidotes to confinement are lots and lots of yoga and making chocolate brownies with the kids. Can't say fairer than that. And with that, Sam, over to you. And Sam, you just need to remember to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining from all over the world um, at very different times, obviously, for you to join. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody who's joining on Facebook as well. Um, just to let you know that on Facebook, unfortunately, we won't be able to pick up your comments in the chat. Um, but still join in and obviously um, I hope you enjoy the, the activities as we go through them and the talk. Okay, so as Eric explained, I work, uh, I live and work in Spain where I work for the, for the British Council, uh, coordinating our secondary classes um, across our teaching centres throughout Spain. And obviously over the last couple of months, um, there have been uh, very big changes in our, our delivery of how we, how we teach. So we've had to go from teaching online, uh, sorry, teaching face-to-face -to, -face to teaching online, um, just from one day to the next, which has been a huge challenge. Um, and obviously, as is probably the case um, with your students as well, most of our students are, are not used to learning in this way online. Online teaching has been around for a, for a long time, but it's uh, for many of us teachers and learners, it's, it's a new context, a new learning context. Um, so most of our learners now are learning English through a sort of combination of virtual online classes and some um, guided learning asynchronous type activities on a platform away from the, the virtual class. So really it's more important than ever for us to be um, trying to encourage them to, to be independent. Um, so with that in mind, I'll just move us on to what we're going to be looking at today, which is having a look at the life skills that our learners need in order to become independent learners. And to, then we're going to be looking at some very practical ways that we can develop these skills and competencies. Um, and it's not a case of starting from scratch by any means. Obviously, there are lots of ideas and lots of um, techniques that we've already been working on with our learners in our face-to-face -face classes that we can transfer um, into our online um, learning environment um, to ensure that our learners are prepared to then um, learn independently. So let's start by actually thinking about what learner autonomy is. Um, and you can see here in the words of Professor Jack C. Richards, he describes it as referring to the principle that learners should take an increasing amount of responsibility for what they learn and how they learn it. So in other words, that our students are involved in deciding what they learn and they actually understand how learning works. So if we would like our students to do this, to be independent learners, we need them to do these things. We need them to play an active role in their learning, so they're involved in the whole learning process. We need them to make decisions about their learning, so that their, their learning is personalised and they're focusing on what they want to learn. And we need them to start to reflect on their learning and evaluate their learning, so they can evaluate how successful their learning is, and what they need to do next in order to continue um, in their learning process. So quite different from a, a traditional teacher-led way of thinking of learning. 
Okay, so let's have a think about who our learners are now as well. Um, we're not really just teaching English anymore. We're teaching our learners a whole range of what we call 21st century skills. So things like critical thinking, collaboration, how to learn, creativity, communication skills, and digital literacy. Um, and all of these play a role in language learning. They're not specific to language learning and our learners will be learning these in other subjects at school as well, not just in their English lessons. But they do all play a role in, in language learning as well. So really, as teachers, we're helping to develop 21st century global learners, which is quite a challenge. So where do we start? Well, if you have a look at this uh, framework that Cambridge have uh, put together, they've actually um, organised the, le the life skills, these life skills, into two broad categories. So we've got thinking and learning skills at the top there. And then we've got another category of social and emotional skills. And they've broken these skills down and then looked at different ways that we can develop each of these skills individually. So today I want to focus on just three of those skills. And that's not to say that the others are not important in language learning, but I felt that these three are relevant in um, helping our learners to become independent um, in their learning and taking responsibility for their learning. So we're going to be looking at them and you can see that they do overlap. So certain activities that we will be looking at, um, you'll be working on critical thinking and collaboration skills at the same time, or possibly all three. And by bringing these three together, what we hope to develop are more independent learners. So let's start with learning to learn and see how we can help our learners to, uh, to develop this skill. So if we're thinking about our virtual classes, our online classes, um, it's really important if we want students to organise themselves and their work for them to understand these how these areas work in terms of the, the course that they're following. So how is the content organised? How is it organised um, each week, each class, over the term? And the objectives, what are they expected to learn um, each class, over a week, and again over a term, or over the whole academic year? And how is the course structured? So how much of the course uh, takes place in a virtual class on a, a platform, for example, similar to, to this one uh, on Zoom? Or how much of it do they have to complete away from the virtual class? So asynchronously on, on a platform uh, through guided learning activities. Um, and we need to make sure that they're very clear about how the synchronous and asynchronous learning link together and complement each other. Um, if you are using um, a platform that has a learning management system, then you as the teacher can keep, can keep an eye on how, uh, how well they are following their guided learning away from the virtual class and give them feedback on that. So if, they are, if they're on target um, to achieving their objectives, to let them know that. Equally, if they, if they need to do more outside the class, or that they're not keeping up with the activities to, to make sure that they know that and give them support and guidance on how to do that. Okay, so when it comes to our own um, virtual classes, there are a couple of ways that we can help our learners to organise their learning. Um, and if you're using a platform like Zoom, you're probably using a PowerPoint as well to deliver a lot of the, of, of the content for the class. So at the start of the lesson, it's always useful to outline what the objectives are for that particular class. So I've just put an example up here where you might be outlining um, the topic that you're going to be talking about, some of the language um, that you're going to be covering in that class, um, and also looking at some language you might be reviewing from a previous class. So there, it's very, very clear to the students what they're going to be learning in that particular class. And likewise, at the end of the class, um, if you want to encourage your students to reflect on what they've learnt in today's class and also ensure that they know what they need to complete before the next virtual class, you could put something like this up as a final slide 
and ask the students to complete this complete the sentences so that they are true about them, about what they've learned and what they need to do for the next class. Um, and they could, uh, they could write that into the chat, send that to you via the chat. Um, and you can have a look after the class and that way you can see um, how well your students are reflecting on their learning at the end of a class and how clear they are about what they need to do for the next class. If they do need to complete activities before that next virtual class, um, then do check that they understand exactly what they need to do, uh, what, the, what the deadlines are, and if they need to upload anything, where they need to upload that to and in what format. Okay, in terms of how we can help students um, with learning strategies in the virtual class, this is something that you probably um, work on uh, in your normal face-to-face -face classes. So there's not a big difference, but it's just, um, I think they're even more important now that students are um, working alone for a larger percentage of a course. Um, so showing them these learning strategies during the virtual class are gonna equip them to be more independent outside the class. So for example, um, different ways to record new target vocabulary. By this, obviously, the, the pre-selected vocabulary that is coming up in a course um, that you teach in a particular lesson. Um, so usually a set of related lexical items. Um, so sh showing them different ways to record that vocabulary through using pictures or mind maps or maybe tables, recording uh, synonyms, pairs of words together or antonyms. Um, any little techniques like that to help them to record that vocabulary and then go back and remember it later and recycle it. Um, if they are dealing with um, a listening or reading, what you don't want to do is be spending long periods of a virtual class with your students reading a text. But if you want them to read the text outside class, um, then obviously they need to know how to approach that text. So do they have the skills they, so they know how to skim the text um, effectively? Or if they're listening to a text, can you give them some skills, some learning strategies to help them to listen for specific information or to listen for the main ideas? Whatever it is that they need to, to complete the task that you set them to do with alongside that text. Um, in terms of reviewing and editing their written work, this is something as well that you could um, include in your asynchronous activities, give them little activities where they have to spot uh, mistakes, look for mistakes in certain sentences, or perhaps at the beginning of a virtual class, you might have a collection of sentences that they produced in the previous virtual class and include a mixture of language that they used well and mistakes that they made um, and have that on the on the welcome screen and just see if they can identify where the mistakes are and if they can identify the good use of language um, and in the chat box they can just write their corrections for the mistakes and there you're training them to to look out for mistakes and to edit their written work which they can then apply to their own written work before they submit it and then finally helping them to reflect on and evaluate their learning in the virtual class will help them to do it outside the class. So we'll have a look at a specific example of how to do that. This um, is another way as well, thinking about emergent language, how to help your students to record and recycle this language in a virtual class. So here what I've taken is a screenshot of um, a whiteboard from a typical Zoom meeting, which is um, a platform that many teachers use to deliver their online classes. And um, this is a way that you can uh, record and recycle emergent language. So by emergent language, I mean that, that unknown language that kind of crops up um, that students ask for while they're completing another activity. So it's really um, interesting language because this is the language that they really do need, um, that, that they ask for. Um, and that they, they need to complete those activities. So as it arises during the class, you can um, section off part of the whiteboard and you can record that vocabulary as it comes up. Um, as you can see here, I've just put a few examples there. With, um, with, the, uh, with an adjective or a noun, so the part of speech in brackets, um, and also with um, a star over, the stressed syllable. 
Um, and then what you can do at the end of a lesson is you can recycle this language. First, you could ask students to keep their own personal dictionary. So at the end of the class, ask them to record the new words for them. This is something I do even with higher primary classes. Um, they all have to choose their new word of the day. Now, obviously, all of these words are not going to be new for all of the students because they've all, they all know different words. But for them to choose maybe two or three of the new words and record them in their own private uh, personal dictionaries. And then at the end of the class, you could play a game. So those kind of typical games that you would play in a face to face class like Pictionary or miming game or taboo. And you can play those games at the end of your virtual class. Um, the only difference is that the student would choose their own word without telling anybody, would either draw a picture, give a definition or mine the meaning of it. And then the other students could write the answers into the chat box. Um, you could also take this language at the end of a virtual class and use it at the beginning of your next virtual class. You could create anagrams from these words and have them on the welcome screen at the beginning of the next class to share with students. So there are lots of different ways that you can recycle this, um, this target lang uh, emergent language, sorry. Okay, so if you remember at the start of the, the webinar, Eric asked you to type into the, the chat box um, your ideas for an alphabet race. This is something you can also use um, with your students. You can have it on at the welcome screen. So depending on what the new topic is, you can already see what students know, what language they already know related to that topic by um, setting up an alphabet race for that topic. And then once the class starts, um, you can ask them to, you can say, right, I'm going to say a letter and I want you to write in your word um, which begins with that letter. So for example, if I said to you all, okay, what word did you uh, write down relating to holidays that begins with the letter C? So we can see in the chat, somebody says cinema, coast, chill. Okay, lots of C words there. What about if I said the word, the letter I? What word did you choose for the letter I? So we've got lots of C, Costa Rica, coconut. Okay, got lots of islands there. Islands and ice creams, sounds perfect. Okay, but obviously you can um, set this activity up for whatever the, the topic is of the class um, that you're teaching. Okay, the next um, area we're going to think about developing are um, how to help our learners to set their objectives and reflect and self-assess on their learning. Um, this is quite challenging to do, um, so you do need to give your learners lots of help and support to do this. Um, but the more they do this, the better they get at it. And the more they self-assess um, and identify what they need to improve and what they need to work on, the more independent they will become. So let's have a look at an example activity, a very simple activity. This uh, you can use, um, it's called a KWL chart, used a lot in mainstream education. K for what I know, and W for what I want to know, and L for what I have learned. Um, and the way that you use this when you're beginning a new topic, um, to find out what students already know about that topic, you would ask them to complete that first um, column with all of the information that they know about the topic. They could do this individually or they could do this in pairs. Then in the middle column, they could write questions, for example, about what they would like to know about, about the topic. So these are not going to be uh, so much language related as content related. And that's fine. That's showing that they're getting them interested in the topic and wanting to find out things and learn about the topic. So you would complete that at the beginning. And then at the end of the module or the unit, they would have a look uh, back over what they'd learned, see which of those questions um, they've answered about what they wanted to know, and also complete what are the things that they have learned. 
over the course of the module. And this will help to guide their, um, their reflection on what they've learnt and then, their, and then lead into their self-assessment. So when we want them to self-assess, I've got an example here of the kind of activity that you could get them to do. You could, if they're doing asynchronous activities away from the virtual class, you could get them to self-assess on the content of each week of learning with something very simple like this. Um, so you list um, the areas that have been worked on on the left hand side and then the students just choose how well they feel that they've learned those areas by circling one of the smiley or not so smiley faces. Um, you can see in this particular example they're all language related so they're sports nouns, sports verbs and comparative and superlative um, adjectives. Um, they don't need to be language related, they could focus on some skills, um, some learning strategies they've developed, um, so other areas as well, maybe some writing skills work that they've developed or speaking. Um, and what is important that they do as well as sort of reflecting on this and, and deciding how well they've done is what comes afterwards. So if they select all smiley faces, for example, then there, um, what you can recommend is how they can then extend that because obviously they're um, on top of all of the learning, but could they perhaps extend their sports vocabulary? So could they now draw a mind map of all the different um, sports equipment or places where, um, where people do sports and try and extend that vocabulary? Similarly, if they're circling um, sad faces, so maybe they're really not sure about comparative adjectives or how, how to use superlative adjectives, there is the moment to step in and give them some more help, some more um, structured uh, language practice there to help them to improve um, in that area. So it's really important um, for them to reflect on this and then see what comes next and how to help their, their future learning. Okay, we're going to now move on to critical thinking. So by thinking critically, what we're, what we're encouraging our students to do is to think for themselves. They're going to be uh, better equipped to make decisions about their learning, to reflect on their learning, um, and to evaluate the success of their learning if they can think critically. Um, so we can look for opportunities to develop critical thinking in our virtual classes. Um, and one way is to help our learners to develop their higher order thinking skills. And a very simple way that we can do this is by thinking about the questions that we ask during a class. So when we ask students questions, we could be asking them to, for example, if we're asking them questions related to a picture, we could ask them um, questions to talk about what they can see or to move, to get them to think a bit deeper what they think about the picture or themes related to the picture or what they might wonder. So what they might imagine, consider or reflect uh, on themes within that picture. So let's have a look at an example to see um, how this can work. So you can see in this picture here, I've got a group of people and a couple of questions here, which are basically just asking students to tell you what they can see and what they're doing. So they are quite um, predictable, typical questions maybe that we might ask students about a picture. Um, the responses that you will get from students are fairly predictable as well. You can predict they're going to talk about the clothes that they're wearing, the colours, perhaps the position where they are in the picture, um, also what they're doing. So they're going to be using the present continuous. It has its own purpose, but it is quite uh, limited. Um, so what we could do is, using the same picture, we could change the questions to encourage them to think a bit deeper. So if we have a look at these questions here, we've got uh, questions which are going to encourage them to think about the picture, about themes relating to the picture. We're going to ask them to compare people in the picture to themselves. We're going to ask them to wonder why they're there imagine perhaps what they'd be saying to each other okay so it's very in a very uh, using the same picture you can change the activity and change the way that uh, encourage a bit more um, thinking from students 
So you can see there where the picture sort of sits. It, it comes at the beginning of a new module. Um, so any kind of picture really that you can find that has a lot of impact, um, a lot going on um, and things for, for the students to, to think about. And also maybe, you know, at the beginning of a unit, if it is going to ask them to think about themes relating to what's coming up in the unit, can be a useful starting point. Okay. Another way we can encourage critical thinking skills is to encourage our learners to train their brains. So these are kind of fun little um, brain training activities, uh, which are very, very simple, again, to set up. Again, you could use pictures to do this. So if you find an interesting looking picture like this one here, you could um, ask students to look at this picture for a few seconds, look at the details in the picture, and just as I'm going to do with you now, what you could then do is to ask your students in the chat, tell them that you're going to take the picture away and to write any words that they remember from that picture. So we'll be able to see here how observant your students are. Obviously, if you want them to, to think critically, they need to be observant too. Okay, and I'll show you again the picture there. So you can see here, yes, different vegetables. Um, okay, it's actually called a foodscape there. Um, and put together by a photographer called Carl Warner, and he develops these landscapes from different vegetables. Obviously, the aim here is not to find out if your students know all the names of all the fruit and veg in English, but it is an opportunity for you to, um, to um, develop their memory skills, which again is all helping towards um, creating better learning skills. And so you could do this with any picture. With, with, uh, which has got things going on in it. Okay. Okay. Another idea you could use if you're using, particularly if you're using PowerPoints in virtual classes, is to give them the instructions upside down. So how many of you are now trying to turn your computers upside down to read this? Reading upside down is another way you can encourage your students to really think very easy to do or you could use puzzles like anagrams or word snakes or codes there you'll you'll find these in lots of um course material um and again you can use these to uh to develop to recycle words that have come up in previous classes Again, these are really easy to um, just copy and put on your welcome slide at the beginning of the class. So while, this, while you're waiting for all your students to arrive, instead of your students just sitting there doing nothing, they can be trying to work out the code or they could be trying to pick out all of the, all of the words from the, from the word snake or work out what the anagrams are, and there they're recycling and uh, using their brains. It's a very simple idea. Okay, so we're moving on to our next area, which is collaboration now. And in order to um, develop collaboration, what we want to try and encourage our students to do is to work well together with their peers. Um, the more they work together with their peers, um, instead of just looking towards the teacher as the main source of um, information, um, we're trying to encourage them to, to learn from each other. Um, and this in itself will help them to develop their decision making skills um, and also to, to rely less on the teacher um, and in that, uh, in that way become more independent. So um, in a face-to-face -face class, obviously the way we would do this is by encouraging them to work in pairs or in small groups. 
um, what the way we can get around that in um, a virtual class is to get them to use um, to work in breakout rooms. So just to familiarize everybody with what breakout rooms are. Um, so individual rooms where you can put students, depending on the platform you use, um, you may be able to assign students to rooms automatically, or you may be able to assign them manually. So you can put specific students into specific rooms and you can decide how many rooms you want to use. So here I've chosen six um, and then you can create the rooms. Um, you can see here that uh, once you've got your room set up, you can also decide how long you want the students to be in those rooms. This is really, really important. So giving students a really clear deadline um, so they know how long they've got to complete the task is essential for the breakout room to work successfully. So I've just put together um, my top tips for using breakout rooms successfully. Before you move students, this is really, really important, before you move students, just double check your instructions so they know exactly what they have to do. Um, that there is a really, really clear task um, which is achievable, but it also focuses, um, caters for fast finishes. So some of your students will um, complete it very quickly. So how can you incorporate something into the task that ensures that they still stay on task and focused? Um, giving it a, a clear time limit, a realistic clear time limit, again, to keep students focused. Um, once you've assigned your students to each breakout room, before you send them off, choose one student from each group to be the spokesperson. And then when you bring them back to the main room, that person will report back on what they um, did in the breakout room, how, what they did during the task. As the teacher, you can monitor the breakout rooms. You can go into the breakout rooms and see how students are getting on at different stages of the activity. And obviously do review your class rules. I mean, that's something you should do uh, at the beginning of each virtual class so all students know what what is acceptable behavior in the virtual class then um, you can move your students to the breakout rooms what i would say in order to um, create a very clear task with a sense of achievement just a couple of things you can do here i would make sure that you've got your um, your task written down so students can see what they have to do um, one way of catering for your fast finishers is, for example, including a specific number into the task. So a typical uh, task here, so why do people do extreme sports? My students could just turn around and say, well, because they like it, and that's it, end of the task. Um, what you can do is you can change that by asking students to think of three or more reasons why people do um, extreme sports. And what you're doing there by including this number is giving them an achievable task um, but also if they finish, if they think of three reasons quickly, if they think of three reasons, they've achieved the task. If they think of three reasons before the end of the time limit, they th can think of some more reasons. So there you're keeping them focused for the whole time. Um, as in addition to this, I would say add a time limit. So in two, in two minutes, for example, how many sentences can you think of before this question tag? Or you could ask them to think of three or more reasons why people do extreme sports and give them two minutes to do that. Okay, so they do know exactly how long they've got to complete the task. Um, another activity you can do is to encourage students how to work together in pairs. So you don't often get to see this in, in course books, um, but I think this is quite a nice activity. Students first think about what are, uh, what is a good behavior in order to be to work well as a pair. So you can have a look through those sentences. And then they put those uh, behaviors into practice in an activity. And you can see here just a very simple activity. They're talking about likes and dislikes. When you send your students into a breakout room to complete an activity, um, it's not just sort of them asking and answering questions, think about, but also what are they going to do with that information they've exchanged afterwards? So then when you bring them back to the main room, um, ask them to questions like this. So what do you both like? So that they've got a reason to actually listen to each other when they're exchanging information. They're not just answering and asking and answering questions because the teachers asked them to do so. 
they're actually thinking about what each other has said and they're using that information then to complete some other task. Okay, um, and this comes from a series of pages within own it that actually focus specifically on helping students to develop these learning skills. So here you can see we're working on learning to learn and collaboration at the same time. Okay, peer teaching. Um, this is a great way of um, taking the focus off the teacher and helping your students to become more independent. Um, this is what well, it's, it's a typical activity you might get to match um, words, new vocabulary, new target vocabulary to definitions. So in this case, our target vocabulary are adjectives to describe personality. And I'm going to show you how I would use this in a breakout room. So in order to help students to uh, teach this vocabulary to each other in the breakout room, you can begin by, um, this is some preparation that you would need to do before the virtual lesson, okay? So before your virtual lesson, take your students, I've got 18 students here, um, and I've divided them into three groups, a red group, a green group, and a purple group. And where I've written S1, S2, you would write your students' names, okay? So there's specific names there at the top of each group. And then underneath, four adjectives of personality that they are going to have to research outside class, write the definitions and find out the opposite adjectives. So basically you would set this activity at the end of your virtual class for students to do before the next virtual class. So you can see the task here. Before the next virtual class, write definitions for your words and find the opposite adjectives. So each student will have four words that they have to write definitions for and find the opposite adjectives. Then they will bring those definitions and adjectives to the next virtual class. So in your next virtual class, you will need to set up, so for example, with my 18 students, I would set up six breakout rooms and each breakout room has a group, and I would have one student from the red group, one student from the green group, and one student from the purple group. Okay, that's minimum. If your students don't divide perfectly into three, that's fine, you just add them to any of the groups, it doesn't matter, as long as you have the min a minimum of one student from each color group. Okay, then, Again, before you send them off to their classes, make sure they understand what they have to do. They have to teach their group the meaning of their words and their opposite adjectives. Then in their breakout rooms, they've got to listen to their peers and write down their words and definitions and their opposite adjectives. And then similarly to with pair work, when, when you bring them back into the main room again, you're gonna play some vocabulary games to check that they've actually been listening to each other. Okay. So you might say, right, okay, when, when you bring them back into the main room, you're going to ask them to write the adjective that describes a person who is happy. So they might all write into the chat the new adjective they've learnt, which is cheerful. Or you might ask them to type into the chat the opposite of an adjective, uh, the adjective helpful. So they would write unhelpful. Okay, just to check that they've all understood. Okay, so that sort of brings us to the end now. We've looked at these three areas, learning to learn, critical thinking and collaboration. And I've shown you uh, a range of ways that you can develop those skills in the virtual classes to help your learners to use them outside uh, the virtual class and become more independent. Um, so now I'd like you to think of your learners and I'd like you to choose one of the activities that you think would work really, really well with them that you'd like to try out with them in your next virtual class. So I've put the activities here on a slide for you just to remind you of the different, some of the different activities we've looked at today. And I'd like you to choose one that you think would work particularly well with your learners um, that you would like to try out with them in your next virtual class. And you could just type the letter into the chat.
Okay. And that brings us to the end then. Super. Thank you very much, Samantha.